This episode of Top to Bottom is sponsored by Noted Analytics. Are you tired of losing sales opportunities to the status quo? Not seeing meaningful information in Serum to help close deals? Empower your team with Noted Analytics, the first guided selling for CRM platform that uses sales methodologies like gap selling, medic, and others to revolutionize the way revenue teams capture, evaluate, and measure sales process effectiveness. Start increasing win rates, shortening sales cycles, and growing average sales prices today. Check it out at notedanalytics.com. And we're live. Good morning, peeps. You are watching Sales Top to Bottom with me, Keenan, your host, and the lovely Beck Holland. Beck, are you surviving the French riots? I am. Thanks for asking. Please tell us a little bit more about that. I've been seeing that in the news recently. You okay? It's it's pretty intense. It is pretty intense. I've seen quite a few, but yeah, I'm okay. What are they rioting over? Garbage? Uh, no, it's a, a pretty sticky issue. But there was um, there was a young boy who basically went through a or a young man who basically went through a traffic light, and he was uh, shot by the French police, and he died. Oh my God. That was it? He just went through a traffic light? Yeah, I, I didn't read all of the details, but it is something to do with he didn't follow traffic laws. I thought they only do that stuff in America. Well, well yep, that's it. That's the start to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with that, we are on to the first segments of this podcast, which is email tear down this is the segment where we tear down emails that were sent over to keenan and beck now on to the first email now this email says uh hi beck could you suggest or this message says, hi, Beck, could you suggest any company that might be looking for regular yoga sessions or an event just for the upcoming International Yoga Day? A friend of mine uh, has 12 plus years experience in power yoga and is looking to enter the corporate sector to teach and train working professionals. Could you let me know if you know someone or have any references? All right, Beck, what do you think about this message? The main thing that I I was taken aback by is they're putting all the work on me to help them. So a lot of times in like referrals, you'll see this happen really frequently where someone's like, hey, do you have anyone in your network that you can refer me to? Or do you know who the decision maker is? And they're putting the work on the person that they have to execute to do a favor for them. So if this person was truly just looking for referrals and wasn't looking to book business with me, which I think that was probably part of the ploy, then I would suggest doing some of the legwork to show that you've invested in yourself so that they should invest in you back. Ikeena, what about you? What are your thoughts on this message? Beck, did you know this person? No. Never met him before in your life? Nope. All right, so, so here's the deal, everybody. You do not ask for referrals from someone who does not know you. End of discussion. I don't care how friendly you are. I don't care how kind you are. When you're asking for referrals, whether it's a reference referral, like, oh, this is a great company to work for or work with, or I like their service, or you're asking for just an introduction to someone who might use your service, if they don't know who you are, they're not going to do it because they don't know what they're, they don't know if you're real, they don't know if you do a good job, they're not going to say, oh, hey, you should check out yoga from this complete fucking stranger I've never met in my goddamn life and know nothing about, but you should go check them out. So, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but I can't help but wonder if this person is is from a, a, a another country or a different culture, because it just shows a complete, I don't know, blind is the word, complete lack of understanding of cultural etiquette when it comes to references or referrals all right well with that we're on to the next message this one says uh hi beck i see we both are in the same field looking forward to exploring opportunities that could be beneficial to both of us 
My products include ID card slash passport recognition SDK, face liveness SDK, uh, parentheses anti-spoofing, face recognition SDK, object detection slash tracking, et cetera. Please check my products and working history. Keenan, what are your thoughts on this message? I think that the first statement looks like we're in similar industries was just made up. <clears throat> I think somebody gave them that line. I don't know why they would give them that line, but I think that's what they put on everybody. Secondly, I, I almost don't even, I mean, we have smart people watching this thing, right? The people watching this, they're smart people. So I don't even think we need to explain to them what's wrong with it because it's so evident. <clears throat> I think what, what jumps out me the most though is that they i wanted like the person who wrote this i wish you were watching you just wasted time effort money etc spending two and a half seconds sending back this stuff <clears throat> so it's not even what we think about anymore it's the fact that you've lost time you're wasting contacts you're wasting linkedin effort. like whatever whatever your cost of this it, you just wasted it all because none of this has anything to do with what beck does nothing Beck, what about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah. So apart from what Keenan said, like we're not in the same industry. If they're in SDK and passport and, you know, all of that, then we're not in the same industry to his point. But the, the second thing that's the most jarring to me is I actually am in the place right now where I arguably could use services around passport, ID card, international travel, like all of that. That's been a major pain point for me since I've been in Paris is getting ID card and, you know, all the different international regulations. So the thing that bothers me the most is I very potentially could be a client for this person, but I have no idea because of how they framed it in the email. I would go a step. Oh, yeah, you can buzz me. I <laughs> this is, by the way, by the way, I do not have my siren in uh, Vietnam, so I'm halfway across the world, So, I, but I do not have my siren, so I'm trying to use a computer sound. If it's loud, not loud, please let me know. It's not bad. It went, it not was bad? Good. It was not good. Bad. Okay. Oh, perfect. Well, I, think the, I think the other thing that, that, <coughs> that <coughs> because this person attacked the email this way, um, he found someone who may have this problem, but it undermines their trust, so Becca's gonna be less inclined to wanna talk to them because the, they've undermined their trust her trust. So it's not just with bad email. It's like, well, I could use you, but I don't like what you just did here. So it makes me a little uncomfortable. So I'm not going to use you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well with that, we are on to the next segment of this podcast, which is sales mythology. This is the segment where we demystify common myths in the sales industry. The first sales myth of today is the only thing you need to do in regards to the problem in the current state is to define it. Keenan, what are your thoughts on this one? The only thing you need to do in the current state is define the problem? Uh, the only thing you need to do in regards to the problem in the current state is to define the problem. No, 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 no. This is like a gimme or a tee up. It's like a softball. Someone just lob this out here for me. No, no. It, it is, there's four things you have to do in the current state. You have to identify the problem. Then you have to define the problem. And for those of you who are, are want a little tip for your sales process, the first two stages in your sales process should, should be problem identified. That's it. Next one should be problem defined. But outside of those and outside of your process, you also need to identify and uncover the root causes, what's causing those problems, you need to understand the impacts. So if those problems exist, what impacts is it creating within an organization? You need to understand the physical and literal. What is the, what, what surrounds the problem? What is the, the physical, what is the context? Is it a big company, small company? How many employees? Who are their customers? You can understand the physical and literal context around it. And then finally, you got to understand how it's affecting, affecting them or irritating them emotionally. So that's what you need for the current state, not just defining the problem. And oh, by the way, you need to define the impact, define the root causes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. right, what about you back? What do you think? Yeah, well, I think it definitely is a first step. And I don't see many people go after a problem, number one, or like, actually define it number two. So it's definitely a first step, um, I think, to discovery. But I think why people struggle with it at large is they're not after solving it. 
Like you would only need to de- go further than defining it if you're interested in solving for it. So I think most salespeople, because their brain is so on me, 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 how do I close this deal? That they're like, okay, I got the problem. Like now I can, now I can move on and, and go into product. But I think that the biggest thing that's missing from that, from my perspective, is after you find the problem and the, the first step, if you're interested in solving it, you know, to Keenan's point, you need to go after root cause, you need to go after impact. But I think uh, the main thing that's missing to it for me is that you need to diagnose all the things that they didn't know to either validate or invalidate the problem, and then also add to it by way of finding impacts and problems that they didn't know about. So I'm not after just defining what they think the problem is, you know, according to their data. I'm trying to uncover, is this the right problem to be solving at all? So people are usually trying to solve a problem for an outcome. They're after some sort of outcome. And so maybe it's the wrong problem to be solving to begin with, the wrong business problem to be solving to begin with, because their outcome won't even be achieved if you do solve that business problem and if you do change that, that root cause. So again, I think defining is definitely the first step to that, you know, but after that, you have a lot of other steps and questions that you need to be asking to truly be diagnosing for the benefit of your buyer. Okay. Well, the next uh, myth for today is a business problem and an impact are the same thing. Beck, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so it's it's a myth uh, because common uh, people commonly believe this. They believe that they, they use them interchangeab- interchangeably. You know, I hear business problem quite a bit. What they mean by that is like, you know, you know, anything in relationship to a metric. So let's say they're not hitting quota, for instance. That's a problem. It's something I need to change. But the impact of that is what happens to them or what happens to the organization as a result of that business problem. So like, for example, if, if I were trying to lose weight, the business problem would be the amount of p- pounds that I want to lose. But the impact is why I want to lose that weight. You know, maybe I was going to a 20 year high school reunion or maybe I was, you know, going to a wedding that I wanted to look good in a dress because I'm going to see someone there or whatever it it may be. But the impact is I I almost think of it as extended pain. What is the pain that will happen or is happening currently that's going to be exacerbated if the business problem is not solved? The business problem is really like the metric and the math of it, for my in in my opinion, but the impact is why it's the driver behind why they want to solve it. So if there's no impact, people typically aren't going to move to solve the business problem. If there's no impact, if I don't hit quota, you know, then I'm usually not going to be really aggressively trying to solve it. If there's no impact, if I don't get my NPS score up or if my customers churn, like, you know, nothing's going to happen to me because of it. And I have plenty of customers then I'm not going to usually solve for it. Hmm. Well, Keenan, what do you think? Um, not a whole hell of a lot to add to what Beck said. I think um, and I, did, I did want to address one thing because people have a tendency to do this. Um, when it comes to problem and impact, problem and impact, um, that's current state. And mm-hmm. we really need to understand how we define that. So using her weight analogy, the problem is that, she said her, but a person is 35, 40, 50, 100 pounds overweight. That's the problem. They're 100 pounds overweight. The impact isn't I want I'm, uh, I want to look good at my thing. The impact is um, I'm concerned about how I'm going to look when I go. Uh, the impact is I am pre-diabetic. The impact is I have, watch this, I haven't had a date. I'm 35, I'm single, I haven't had a date in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Okay. The idea is that you got to really zero in on where they are now and the impact of the problem on them in their current environment. You can eventually translate it into what will happen and what they want to get, but, but anchoring people in that current state problem and impact creates the, the, the uh, discomfort to the point of it's untenable or intolerable, right? Because we need to understand that people don't change unless the current state is untenable or intolerable. So as, as Beck said, the impact is what creates the motivation to buy. That is the part that makes it untenable or intolerable. And if you can't get to that intolerable piece, it is far more difficult to influence the sale. You wanna really make it even more powerful. It's the impact that drives the urgency 
that helps you understand whether or not a deal is going to close in the first place. I work with people all the time. And and I tell you, not to work with people all the time. I work with people all the time who are, quote, unquote, good. And I don't say, quote, unquote, because they're not. But they're good sales leaders. They're good sales executives. They've made their numbers for years. But I spend 10 minutes digging into their pipeline. And on 85% of the deals, they have no fucking clue whatsoever what happens if that buyer doesn't buy. Right? Like a doctor. There's no clue whatsoever if that if that guy who's 150 pounds overweight doesn't lose the weight he doesn't know if they're going to hit i'm you know hypothetically speaking doesn't know if they're going to um if they're going to uh get di- if they're pre-diabetic doesn't know if uh they have heart condition they're like, they don't know any of that so therefore they can't provide the insight on why that person needs to start changing now and that's why impact so important in fact said it sales is about change Impact is the motivation to change. If you as a salesperson have not gone to the currency impact, you have no influence on why they should change. And if you don't have influence on why they should change, they will not buy. Ooh, okay. Well, the last sales myth of today. I like that, huh, Min? Min's like, Whoa. I liked it. I liked it. It was a mic drop, you know? All the way from across the world, I felt it. But the last <laughs> sales myth of today is uh, the business problem and the desired outcome are the same thing. Keenan, what are your thoughts on this one? Um, no, and, and this, I mean, Beck, Beck hit it really before. Desired outcome is the future state, right? The desired outcome is where do I want to go? So if currently I'm 200 pounds overweight and I haven't um, gone on a date in six months and I haven't got lucky and I'm, and I'm alone, right? That's all my current state. My desired outcome, watch what I do here, is I would actually like to be in a serious relationship. I would like to feel confident in my ability and in my physical presence. So when I go out, I can actually meet people. Why do I want to meet those people? Because I would like to actually have a good long-term relationship, which hopefully correlates or or, uh, transitions into a uh, a marriage. And then I'd like to have children and raise a family. So my desired outcome is to actually have a family. Mm -hmm. So now what I've done is I've created a gap. I don't know if you guys did this on purpose or not, but now I've created a gap. Where I am currently right now is having had a date. I'm alone. I'm by myself. I don't feel confident, etc. I'd like to be married and have children and uh, raise a family where I'm happy and, and feel fulfilled and I'm giving to other people. Look at the size of that gap. What am I doing to willing to change that gap? So desired outcome is not the same as is is a problem. Mm. Now, what about you, Beck? What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's a really technical conversation, but I think that the the differences are are massive when you really break it down. To me, the the impact is why. I really want to change, but the desired outcome is the future state that needs to be yielded in order to uh, achieve that outcome, you know, in my opinion. So I only have 15 seconds left. I'm not going to get buzzed. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to leave it. You're going to leave it to the bell. Tune in next week. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hey, would you like to go forward or should we go on to the next segment? Back? All right, we're going on. We're going on. Well, now we are going on to the next segment of this podcast, which is Take It or Leave It. This is the segment where I introduce common sales tactics and Keenan and Beck let us know whether they would take it or leave it. So the first one of today is correcting the buyer in the moment when you hear them say something that's not correct from your perspective. Beck, take it or leave it. I'm a leave it for sure. Um, I think it's a slippery slope uh, if you start correcting them in the moment. And a lot of times it can diverge the conversation into why they do or don't believe you in your correction. When I'm in discovery, like I'm in full, full blown focus mode of I need to discover a lot of different things in that 30 minutes. So from a pattern perspective, I just don't want it to disrupt the flow. So I want to gather everything that I have. And then where you challenge them, in my opinion, in my experience, you don't really have to challenge them. Meaning in the demo, I'm just presenting the facts and why I think something is in in a certain way. But like, in my opinion, during discovery, it can be distracting for ego's sake if you're going to correct them when they say something right in the moment. That's just my view, though. What about you, Keenan? Take it or leave it. Oh, I think I've been set up on this one. 
No. I've been set up. It's a, I was going to say take it, but I almost have to say TVIT, and I hate TVITs. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very situational. So if it's, if it's immaterial, I'm probably not going to say something ever. Not because I don't want to, just immaterial to the conversation. If it's material, I'm going to interrupt them, particularly if it's material to the remaining of the flow. So if they believe something that is not accurate, and I can't think off the top of my head what that would be, but if they believe something that is not accurate, that's going to affect my ability to properly help them, then I'm going to stop and, and, and correct them right then and there and get buy-in on the correction so I can continue to go down that path. All right. Well, the next take it or leave it for today is prioritizing closing new customers over expansion selling. Keenan, take it or leave it. God dang it. You guys fucking nailed me today. Um, <laughs> that is also a TVIT, and here's why. It, that is very situational to the business. So if you have, like I call it wallet share, if you have a business where once you get in, there's a large portion of additional add-on business that you can go get in comparison to the brand new business, I'll take that all day. You, the cost of acquisition, not per customer say, but I don't know if you could count this, but the cost of getting a new piece of business, if you consider each piece of business a customer, this is not going to go. I got people trimming hedges here. Um, but um then yeah, go for it. But if it's not, then you go for the new business. So it just really depends on your business and the size of wallet share and your existing accounts on whether or not you do that. Uh, what about you, Beck? Take it or leave it. I am a leave it in most cases, you know, so it does, it is dependent on context like Keenan was talking about. Um, but I'm, I'm a leave it. It's harder to earn a new customer than it is to usually cross sell up sell and i'm specifically thinking about b2b SaaS. like specifically if you're selling into mid-market enterprise companies you have a lot of different divisions that you could sell into a lot of different stakeholders that you could sell into but i think the people reason people don't do it is it's hard because they have experience with you and if you didn't know their problem to begin with i have a hard time believing that they solved it and they solved it because of you and your knowledge of the problem so those are usually the things that I'm going to need to see as a customer to have faith that I should really upsell and cross sell, you know, allow you to do that within my organization. That it would be a win for me as a buyer, you know, because I am putting my name on on the line. Um, so I think that's why typically people they try to start over and go at more at bats as opposed to taking care of their current customers. Okay. Well, the last take it or leave it for today is having a predisposed elevator pitch ready. Back, take it or leave it. I am a, a take it if it's per persona. I think that your elevator pitch should constantly be surrounding itself around a problem and a problem being defined as anything that prevents them from achieving a goal in relationship to a metric or achieving their metric. So I ask the orgs a lot of like scale of one to 10, how similar are your different elevator pitches for all your personas? And they say nine. And I'm like, well, now you've got a metric for how product centric you are. If it has nothing to do with their metrics as a persona. Leave it. <laughs> Keenan, care to elaborate? Nope. Just leave it. No All pitch right. ever. Hey, can you guys hear that? Is that loud? It's not super loud, but we can't hear it. Okay. Well, hey, with that, we are going on to my favorite segment of this podcast which is the inbox this is the segment where beck and keenan answer questions from our audience now again i am not in my usual uh studio so we do not have the mailbox i know beck is extremely sad about that <laughs> but let's get on to the first question which is from, who is from, uh, Cassandra Valkner from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She says, let's be honest, I'm an old woman, about to turn 68 in September. Recently, I've been seeing a lot of my employees, especially the younger guys, using things like images and emoji, uh, emojis in their emails. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan, but who knows? Maybe that's just me getting old. My question to you two is, in this day and age, do you think emails 
should have a certain uh, should still have a certain level of formality, or is this just an evolution of the platform that I need to adjust to? Uh, Beck, what are your thoughts on this one? That's a great question. Um, so I would have had a different answer before today, but I was online and I noticed that um, uh, Charles over he's the CEO over at Lempire. They actually punted out quite a bit of research and images as a whole, depending on how you send them, can improve reply rates. But uh, GIFs in specific are 20% less reply rate than another type of image. So to me, it was really validating. I haven't liked GIFs for a very long time. I think they're too silly. I think they put, even if you get them to laugh, now they're in the parent ego state and you're in the child ego state. So it's hard to actually talk about something pragmatic afterwards that's how you start the conversation but the research proved you know in my opinion just that like gifs are usually used to make some kind of joke but an image in general like if you're doing a screenshot of a certain review that was sent or a screenshot of their profile for instance actually can be extremely relevant and increase reply rates one tip is that if to not put it as an entire image so i actually did a a deep dive g schooled me on on email deliverability for like two hours and one of the things that they found was an actual image, like a newsletter, for instance, with all the different, like it's as an entire image block can really decimate uh, your deliverability. So I would suggest um, anywhere from the research showed uh, two up to three after four, it's had to, uh, started to have diminishing returns, like any more than four images, and you're going to start to uh, hinder the response rate as opposed to increase it. Hmm. Uh, what about... You know, a timely question. What about you, Kanan? What are your thoughts on this one? Um, I so I, I look. I don't have the data, so I have to go with what Beck said. Um, at least it relates to deliverability. Uh, I think there are two pieces I want to attack here. One is the idea that do pictures work or not work? Should we do them or not do them? I don't like when people ask questions like what works or what doesn't work. Go fucking find out. Like, like literally, at the end of the day, in my opinion, there are no rules to anything. What is your goal? Try everything and anything until you reach your goal. That's the difference between most people. They try to play in a box and then they don't understand why nothing's working. So try try the pictures, try different things and see what works. And if it works, double down. If it doesn't work, stop doing it. It's not gonna kill you. The other thing I heard in this though is this woman's whole point about being old, right? I, I, I just get that, just get this. If you find yourself resistant to doing something because it's not what you know, that's a red flag that you're the problem. You didn't do that as a kid. When you're 15, 17, 19, 20, you never said, oh, I've never done that before. I'm not going to do it. Or this is how they've always done. I'm not going to change. No. You just accept the change that came at you. Why we get old and all of a sudden, I haven't, I, oh, is it just me getting old? I think it has to have some formality. Why? Why does it have to have some formality? Why? Why? Because that's all you know. That's the, like, that's the one thing we control is getting older. And I'm older. I'm not 68, but I'm older. Stop. Stop older people. You bring this sense of how it was into the equation and think that's how it should be. And anything that's changing is, is bad or informal or this. Just cut it out. Get over it. Move on. Well, hey, uh, we have just enough for one quick question. This one says, uh, this one is from which domain anonymous. I don't know why the question seems fine. Uh, they ask, what advice do you have for successful uh, business lunches are these best used for building relationships and getting to know the clients or do you actually talk about business uh keenan what are your thoughts on this that's a great question i think it should be both if you're going to be in person with someone in a, in a quote unquote social gathering absolutely it should be both it should not be a strict discovery get to know them you're there for a while you're watching what to eat it's a social environment just go for it <laughs> I'm sorry, Keenan. I gave you a little bit of time to finish that off. I know I only gave you 13 seconds. Is this getting seconds. louder, by the way? Because they're coming closer. Oh, yeah, yeah. A little bit uh, louder. Yeah, they're louder. But not, not, nothing too crazy. They're not deafening, but they're not, louder for sure. All right. Just let me know if it's disrupting. I can go in, well, I'll go inside. Hold on. Gotcha. Sounds good. Well, while he goes inside, we are going on to the next segments of this podcast. Which is the challenge. This is the segment where 
Keenan and Beck break down a challenging subject within the sales industry. And today's challenge is if I don't know what problem I solve, how do I figure out exactly what that problem is uh, that I solve for buyers? Beck, why don't you start us off with this one? Um, well, I feel like Keenan should start off with this one. He's the, the problem master. But if you, do you want me to go? I, Mr. Problem Master, how you feel? So, um, oh, no, I think he's pointing to no, me. So, no, you go, Beck. You go. So, You're the problem master. You, you, my, you're not giving yourself enough credit. My, my, my biggest, um, and a lot of people will say this, you know, in my experience, at least they'll say, I don't know what problem I solve. Or when they tell me their value prop, I'm like, okay, so that's a litmus test to me that you don't know just based on the <clears> alone <throat> that they don't know what problem they solve. The first thing that I would do as a piece of that, I'll do two steps and then I can pass. The first step that I would do is evaluate what are all my buyers metric on. So I have a static point of like, what goal are they typically trying to achieve? And the second thing that I would evaluate is uh, what metric do I affect and how do I affect it? And what do I change in order to affect it? So I think about, you know, for sales reps, for instance, it's quota attainment. So a lot of things that you could change about that are ASP, sales cycle, you know, uh, conversion ratio. And then I would start to back into the math of a, a normal buyer for me is going to be someone who is typically behind on quota, afraid that they're about to be behind on quota. There's a threat competitively that's going to, you know, steal business away from them. But it's all going to orient itself around their actual their actual quota team. And so the first step that I would do in finding out the problem that I solve is understanding what that buyer persona is metriced on. And the second step that I would, I would think about doing is saying <clears throat> what conditions would cause this person to not hit the metric or not hit a goal in relationship to that metric. So I'll give a, an example of the goal in relationship to the metric, and then I'll pass to Keenan. You know, <clears throat> working with SDRs. So I typically work with the SDRs who are struggling to hit full quota attainment. Quota attainment for them is going to be SQLs, usually sometimes influence pipeline, but booked meetings, SQLs, usually where they're going to rely. I worked with a buyer at one point who uh, their SDRs had gotten really good and they were past quota, but because they were so much past quota, they were wanting to get promoted to AEs really quickly. And so they were having to basically send them off really quickly and they couldn't fill a hiring need or a, a ramping need that was aggressive enough to be able to get the new onboarding team. Hold up. Keenan, hold up. So, so I would think go. about, the first step I would think about is identify the metrics for your buyer. The second step that I would think about is how do I affect those metrics for my buyer in the desired direction? What do you, does pain quote unquote, usually look like for them? The third thing that I would think about is what are the goals and relationships that metric that I affect? Like what can they not do? And then what do you affect in the current state to be able to change that in a way that changes the business problem that achieve that changes the business impact and achieves the outcome that they're looking to to achieve we might run down keenan what do you think um i think beck did a really good job um i don't know that I would add anything to that so <clears throat> i'll just give a, a a new lens to get to the same place that beck did um start with your product and ask why was your product created in the first place? All right. So, so uh, if you give me any product, let's see if we can have some fun with this. Min, give me any type of product. <laughs> uh, let's say the Scrub Daddy. What the hell's the Scrub Daddy? Yeah, you don't know what it's. Okay, let's go different. Let's go now different. I'm curious, let's go. Though, what's the Scrub Daddy? Oh, it's the it's the really famous um really famous sponge that they had on on TV. Oh, where... oh, oh, yeah, 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 with the smiley face. Yeah, with the smiley face. With the yes, smiley face. yes, 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 yes. Okay, so if I what I know about the scrub daddy is the 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 problem it solved was that pans weren't properly being cleaned, and and that sponges collected all of this uh, uh, grime. What grime? Yeah, grime. But they started to smell and had mildewy and all that type of stuff. So the 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 Sponge Daddy was created to allow you to clean both pots and pans with a scrub when it was cold 
right? And it also allowed you to clean glasses and other things when it got warm because it got soft mm -hmm. and it didn't get mildewy. So the problem it solved was throwing away sponges that would get mildewy and gross and not, no one want to put to their thing. Two, it solved the problem of, of harming Teflon. So you're ruining your pans using other things like um, uh, other types or of sponges. Steel wool. Yeah, steel wool or, or, or things that uh, that uh, weren't, weren't safe for the pan. So I don't I, I didn't build it, but I just stopped for a second because here's the problem. Why would someone use that? Why was this built? What what was going on? This is what I do, everybody. What is going on in someone's world today that would make them say, I need this? Not this is where people sell people mess up. They're like, well, what do they want? And that's where they have, to have a hard time. So you have to stop saying, what would someone want? What was this? We said earlier, what is their desired outcome? You have to stop saying that and say, there's somebody out there who doesn't have this. Why does their world suck? So whatever it is you sell, I don't care what the software is. I don't care what it is. If they don't have you, what sucks about their world right now? Not do not, because they're going to do this. Well, they can do and they can do. That's not the fuck what I just asked. Mm -hmm. Okay. What sucks before you show up? Like Beck said, what sucks? We're not making all our SQLs. What sucks is our cost of acquisition is too high. What sucks is <clears throat> we're not filling the pipeline. That sucks. So when Beck comes in, like, ooh, somebody can help us with these things. We like that. Let's talk. Mm -hmm. So you got to almost look like sales is a white horse, not to deliver some future state right away. But in, in essence, someone is stuck in a hole. Someone, you know, is is falling and can't get up. Look that that look, everybody. You want to know? Everybody know I'm falling. I can't get up. Everybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. Live the bird. That, yeah, yeah, that is the that that whole whoever, the reason that was so popular is they got right to the problem instantly and made it their fucking entire freaking thing because that was the problem. People were afraid they would fall and couldn't get up and they'd rot on the floor. Mm -hmm. So they figured out that problem and that problem became marketing, sales, the tagline, everything, right? Without our button, if you fall and can't get up, you're going to rot on the floor. Mm -hmm. So, ta-da, we're here da -da 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 -da, to the rescue, right? Lifeline or whatever it was called. You remember the tagline, but then remember the product, for Christ's sake. <clears throat> so that's it. Take your product, ask yourself, what is someone dealing with today that is miserable, they can't handle, and that you can come in, hey, I'm here, I can fix that. That's how you figure it out. <clears throat> Back, want to close this out? Uh, yeah, we have two minutes left. Uh, well, I think we can go on to the, we can go on to the next problem in a second, but, um, something I, I would think about to, to add on to what Keenan said is, uh, in some scenarios I have seen, uh, like in the scrub daddy, again, I don't really know the scrub daddy product. Is it just, just cut through really hard stuff? Well, basically it's, it's created so that when cold, when it goes through cold water, it hardens up the structure of the sponge hardens up, allows you to take off rough, uh, like grime and whatnot. And then when you put it under hot water, it softens so it can clean, uh, but that's the basics of it. Okay. So I, w I would think about, I would take a step back and think about, there are some products that are created. Uh, you can get the job done today, but you can't get it done without blank. You know, so like kind of to Keenan's point, I can get the job done with the sponge, but I can't get the job done with the sponge without it smelling afterwards, you know, or I can, mm. I can get it, to, uh, some, some of these pans cleaned with this, this one sponge, but I can't get both, you know, both jobs done with one sponge. So point being, I would think of it also to tack on into the lens of sometimes a good enough solution is working but it creates a whole nother one. And that's what people are alleviating is it doesn't create this second lateral problem. So I'd also consider that whenever I'm, I'm thinking about it. The side effects, a hundred percent, the lateral problems. Okay. We're going to uh, quickly no. go on. To no, we're okay. not going to go on to another one. We get 28 seconds. How are we going to pull another problem out of that? I guess you're right. I guess you're right. No, but I, I look, I think more than understanding what the problem is, I, I challenge anybody out there who's selling right now. If you're selling anything and you haven't stopped for 10 minutes to figure out what problem you solve, you're the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're the problem. Know what environment you're going into and why that environment sucks without your product. That's how you do it. Yeah. It's something you can't do. That's what a problem is. 
Okay, well, with that, we are on to the last segments of this podcast, which is... Oh, listen, just one more thing. This is the segment where Beck and Keenan give us their closing thoughts. Uh, let's start with Keenan. What are your what is your just one more thing? Three weeks in a row. Wow. Interesting. I was hoping you didn't notice. Oh, of course I noticed. She's chirping <laughs> in your ear, man. She is chirping in your ear. Um look, I I, I what I'd like to say is I'd like to see a little more um I'd like to see a little more humility in sales. Uh, we have been doing this for 75, 80, 90 years since the industrial revolution came on. Um, but in modern selling, you could say probably 70 years, 60 years, start with maybe Dale Carnegie or whatever. And there's just, there's just too much. This is where we've always done it, or there's too much protection of their turf or ideas and methodologies. Um, I sort of felt it when I wrote the book, but I'm really feeling it now when it comes to deal management. I am blown away at how poorly deal management is handled, while at the same token, how few people see it's an actual problem. I, I, it, it almost feels like freaking <clears throat> uh, weight in America. It is our number one killer, and no one seems to think it's a problem, right? Or guns in America. Oh, yeah, you get this problem, but uh, it's not really a problem, right? And I'm sure some people are already flipping because I just said that, right? But deal management is an example, but there's a million other examples in sales. We have a, a, a sales problem in this country and maybe around the world. But I'm just going to stay in North America that we don't have good people. Don't look at salespeople in a good way. We're not perceived in a positive fashion. Why? Because of how we do it. And yet we don't seem to let that bother us. We don't seem to really embrace collectively that change because we should be perceived as like as like a doctor, well, I can't say a lawyer, unfortunately, but as a doctor or somebody, right? <clears throat> or a therapist, like, like as somebody who brings value, but we're not. We're seeing somebody as a necessary evil and we're not willing to change it. And I think there's just too much ego, not enough humility for us in organizations to step back and change. And secondly, we're still holding on to that bro mentality and we're still holding on to that. I got to get it closed at all costs. Look, it's, it's we're one week, not even one week into the third quarter. Do you know how many people I had I talked to last week that were like, all right, this talk to me next week. It's the end of the quarter. Can't focus on anything else but the end of the quarter. That is not healthy. If you're literally going from quarter to quarter in the last two to three weeks of a quarter is all you can think was the quarter, the quarter, quarter, that tells you how messed up not just sales is, but our but but not capitalism, but but business is in this country. A dollar today is no different than a dollar tomorrow. And anybody who's convinced themselves that, yeah, I get it. If you miss your freaking, your, if you're public, public company, you miss your, your earnings by what? It goes down three, seven, nine percent. Everybody's pissed. Mm -hmm. But if I can come back tomorrow and that money I would have brought in here at a non discounted rate. So if I missed it by, I'm making up a number, 500 million, but I'm able to close that 500 million in the first half of the next quarter. And oh, by the way, instead of turning that 500 million to 400 million, because I had to discount it to get it in Q2, now I get it in Q3. Now I'm up 100 million than I was. That not only is it gonna come back three or 4%, it'll come back in three months. Stop. Stop worrying about the quarter. Stop worrying about it all now. We've got to change our mentality, man. We got to change our mentality. Got to. <clears throat> all right. Now, Beck, what is your just one more thing? Yeah, my uh, my one more thing is is <coughs> pretty quick. Um, it's about the value of of finding something for someone that they don't know. Um, and I just want to get give an example. I'm looking for uh, ceiling lights right now that are really interesting. And there's one ceiling light that is basically a bunch of different bubbles. It looks like bubbles are coming out of the ceiling you know, uh, to a fixture that I was like, oh, I love this. But I looked at the diagram and it said that it was um, 50 centimeters wide and 27 meters uh, height. But then I looked at the diagram and it says uh, that the light hangs 50 centimeters down, which is a long way down to be going from the ceiling, you know, 50 centimeters down. So I pinged me the uh, customer support line. I was like, hey, I have a question about this. It says 50 centimeters diameter and 27 height. 
but then your diagram, you know, I, I was confused because your picture and they're like, I was like, is this 50 centimeters wide and 27 centimeters uh, down? And they said, yes, uh, that is the correct height. I said, okay. I said, then I'm going to go ahead and order it. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. I said, by the way, uh, you're, have you, have you seen any kind of churn, you know, of customers on this length? They're like, yeah, we can't figure it out. <sighs> ton of people are going to the landing page. Ton of people are putting in their cart, but then people aren't checking out. And I said, it might be, or it would have been in my case, because your picture represents it to where it's 50 centimeters height, which is really, really deep from the, the ceiling. And the response from their team was overwhelming joy, number one, because I had found the root cause. They couldn't figure it out. They had tried putting it, you know, different kind of discounts, set it up, but they couldn't figure out why people were putting it in the cart or looking at it a ton, but then not ultimately buying it. So much so to where they comped the ceiling lamp for me. And it's 500 euros a piece. And I'm getting two of them. They comped them for free because I found the root cause of why they're churning customers. And that wasn't at any request. They just did that proactively. So my, my push is when you find that for buyers, they are, in my experience at least, they're overwhelmingly grateful for it. And they're going to take care of you as a seller if you take care of them first by finding out the stuff that they didn't know that was hurting them. So if you find a root cause, if you make that your mission or make that your focus or make that your job, I think the buyers will swing back to your side because you swung to theirs first. But it was pretty jarring. Yeah, they just gave me, they're like, yeah, you can have them for free. And I'm like, these are 500 euro piece plus shipping. And they were like, that's fine. Because they knew the money that they are going to not hemorrhage anymore because of one diagram is much less than just giving me two lamps. So anyway. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, that's our podcast. That's it. Oh, oh wait, Keenan, you're muted. Well, thank you very much, everybody. You've been watching Sales Top to Bottom with me, Keenan. And I'm back. See you next week. Peace.